Let's go ahead and start tonight as we usually do with um, a recitation of page 73, this first verse here. Uh, tonight we'll do this three times in English, recalling the Buddha, uh, having this real sense of homage and um, gratitude to the Buddha for all that he accomplished that we too can accomplish by aligning ourselves with the Buddha's intentions. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, a subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge to the founder, the endowed, transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Then go forward to the short mandala offering prayer on either 97 or 98, depending on which version of the prayer book you have, and the group from Missoula or anyone else who has the older prayer book, it's on page 88, I believe, in that prayer book. So we'll do this short mandala offering prayer in English. Uh, skip over the request to turn the Wheel of Dharma to the uh, offering mantra, the Idam Guru, and so on, so on. And then we'll go on to Refuge in Bodhicitta. That's, uh, uh, be, we'll, we'll do that in English once and then twice in the Tibetan. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, Adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niryata Yami. I go for refuge until I am enlightened. To the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chodang soki choknam la jangchu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki chunyan gi pe sunam gi jola penshir sangye drupar shok. Sangye chodang soki choknam la jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki chunyan gi pe so nam gi dola penchir sangye drupar shod. Okay, you can set the prayer book aside until the end of class. Let's do a short meditation then before we begin, just to give ourselves a chance to. Uh, let go of any distractions we might have in our mind as best as we can. And then on the basis of a bit more focused mind, we'll set our motivation together in a short meditation. So just begin with paying attention to the breath, whatever way suits your mind, whether you're counting the breaths or focusing on a specific sensation, such as at the tip of the nose, or maybe even just being present with the general breathing in and breathing out of the body. Whatever way that you're working with the breath, try to stay with the breath as best as you can. When the mind wanders away from the breath, when you see that that's happened, let go of whatever it was that was distracting you and gently guide the mind back to the breath. 
So I'll ring the chime and we'll do this in silence for just a few minutes before I lead you in a meditation to set our motivation. Now let's set our motivation together. And tonight in doing this, we can recall that the main topic of what we're studying in this course is the wisdom of emptiness. We've been specifically looking at chapter 18 that talks about the emptiness of the person, the self, the I. And why this is so crucial for us to understand is because every single sentient being who's still in samsara is under the control of this ignorance that clings to this sense of I. It thinks that the I exists in this substantial, independent, inherent way. So when we engage in this study, we can certainly do so initially from a desire to increase our own wisdom so that we can be free from all the afflictions that we possess, all the karma that is induced by those afflictions, so that we ourselves can attain a state of liberation, a state of nirvana that is a full pacification of all of our ignorance, the delusions, and so on. But moreover, because every single being is just like us in being under the control of this ignorance, and moreover, because we are connected to those beings, because they have shown us incredible kindness, not just in this life, but in every single life, we have depended upon others to a great degree for everything that we have that brings us some form of happiness, pleasure, peace. And moreover, we need all of those sentient beings in order to achieve our greatest potential. So with a real feeling of closeness to them, we generate the mind of bodhicitta that is intent upon helping all those beings to realize emptiness, to be free from their own afflictions, 
to attain nirvana and eventually the state of non-abiding nirvana, the state of Buddhahood. And we recognize that in order to do this, we ourselves have to become a Buddha. So in this way, we cultivate bodhicitta with these two aims, these two aspirations of benefiting all sentient beings to the greatest degree by working on ourselves to accomplish our own greatest potential, a state of enlightenment so we can help others to do the same. So make that motivation very firm in your heart so that everything we do tonight is influenced by that and becomes a cause for that eventual result and the enlightenment of both ourselves and all sentient beings. Okay. So in the last class, we were working our way through some of the last few verses of um, uh, chapter 18 of Nagarjuna's text. Again, in this course, we're looking at these three chapters. We started with 26, which was on the 12 links of dependent arising, explaining the whole process by which under the control of the first link of ignorance, we go on to create all the causes and conditions to continue to go from life to life, to continue to have rebirths within samsara. In chapter 18, which is mostly on the self, but also we're getting into the area where it also is covering essentially all phenomena because it's not just the self or the person that lacks inherent existence. It's all phenomena that uh, we mistakenly believe to be inherently existent, whereas they are all empty of that. So in these last, the verse that we started, went through last time is um, the ninth one, which is essentially the first of a two-part uh, outline that has to do with the characteristics of things as they really are. What are the characteristics of phenomena in their, in terms of discerning them through our ultimate analysis and finding their emptiness? And the first verse that we looked at last time, we haven't gone on to the second one, which is verse 10, but verse 9, which was the first under this outline, shows the characteristics of things as they really are according to the arias. And we really only made it through one point of that, so that's where we'll pick up tonight. But essentially, there are five characteristics that are talked about in this verse that are when emptiness appears to an Arya, an Arya being the uh, person who is superior in their knowledge, who has attained the rank of, uh, of all seeing, uh, the path of seeing, where they have developed the wisdom that knows emptiness directly, no longer clouded by any sort of conceptual overlay. Emptiness in their mind has, they've kind of merged into one. So they have this direct experience of emptiness. The phenomenon that we are conceptually labeling as emptiness isn't known conceptually by those beings. So what we found in looking at already in um, chapter, in this verse of chapter 18, and this verse number nine, is this very first one, that you cannot know emptiness in that way by depending on someone else's knowledge. That was the idea we went through and had rather lively discussion of cataracts and other analogies for you know, something that someone can see that other people can refute through their wisdom and their knowledge that those things aren't actually there. The falling hairs that appear to someone with cataracts don't exist in reality. But essentially, again, this is uh, the truth is that we cannot possibly know it just by someone else's knowledge. They can explain it to us and we can develop a conceptual idea of emptiness, but to actually know it at that level requires us depending upon our own insight rather than someone else's. So let's go ahead and go back to verse nine and read that again. Uh, the five characteristics are indicated, two in the first line, then one in the next line, the next two in the third line. So those are the five characteristics. Let's read this together. Not knowable from another, tranquil, not fabricated by mental elaboration, devoid of conceptualization, and not differentiated. That is the character of suchness. So I used Ocean of Reasoning to go through uh, that first characteristic, which here was called not knowable from another. Once more, we do have to depend upon others who have that knowledge of emptiness to explain it to us, to give us clues as to how we go about realizing it ourselves, but we cannot depend upon their wisdom. The wisdom has to be cultivated within ourselves. We have to clear away our own cataracts of ignorance. No one else can give us that pure vision, that pure, pure view. So in terms of Ocean of Reasoning, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary that I've been using, we're on page 386. This is Jay Garfield and uh, Gishing Awan Semten's uh, translation of this. And so kind of uh, 
towards the lower part of uh, that page where it goes on to the second characteristic. So the second characteristic in our text, it was called tranquil. He, uh, he uses the translation peaceful. And it says, just as someone without cataracts does not see falling hairs, the way things uh, are, really are is empty of inherent existence, that is without essence. So a way of thinking about this in terms of being tran tranquil or pacified is that all of these sorts of you know, overlays of dependent or of, uh, inherent existence are completely removed. Uh, Geshe uh, Tenzin Temple in his commentary on this, he says, the second characteristic is peaceful. This is from the point of view of pacifying the conception of true existence and pacifying inherent established, that is being empty of inherent establishment. So again, recall that there's, there are kind of, there's an object that we are clinging to in regard to all phenomena as if they inherently existed. And when we have that wisdom realizing emptiness, when we become an Arya being and have that con non-conceptual wisdom, that is pacified. There's no longer any um, conception of inherent existence that is overlaid on top of that. So in a way, I mean, when we even talk about, you know, nirvana being the full pacification, that's because it's fully removed all of that conceptual overlay of the uh, belief in inherent existence, the clinging to inherent existence. So this is the understanding of peaceful is that uh, at that point when someone has realized emptiness directly, the way things really are is empty of inherent existence without any essence. There's no longer any room for that misconception to creep in. So in that way, we've been pacified of that misconception. The third characteristic in our text was uh, called not fabricated by mental elaboration. They used kind of a strange translation in the, uh, the ocean of reasoning, not fabricated by fabrication. It's kind of... Um, but I guess it's the same word, essentially. One's the verb and the other is the noun. So they use, again, not fabricated by elaboration or mental elaboration. And in Lama Tsongkhapa's text, it says, the verbal fabrication by means of which things are fabricated no longer fabricates them. That is, they are inexpressible. So we, can't, we can no longer kind of give any sort of fabrication or elaboration as to what emptiness is because at that point, it becomes non-conceptual. And... It's a, they say it's inexpressible. That would be another word that we could use to describe emptiness at that point. Um, Geshe uh, Tenzin Temple says, this means that the meaning of emptiness is not fabricated by speech. With speech, one can express emptiness, the lack of ultimate existence or the lack of inherent existence. But because whatever is expressed does not ultimately exist, it is not ultimately expressed. Not fabricated means not ultimately expressed. So we can say in that vein too, that yeah, you don't really have the ability to um, give any sort of definitive or um, inherent uh, meaning to it because it cannot, be it cannot be elaborated in that way. It cannot be fabricated in that way. There's no room again for any sort of fabrications, elaborations of inherent existence. So it's, again, most of these are pointing to the same way, even when His Holiness talks about this verse, I think he just summarizes it and says, essentially this is you know, just referring to things let me see if I can find that verse again. I have to go back to where that was in uh, the text here. He says, um, this stanza presents what we know, at what are known as the five main characteristics of ultimate truth. Basically, the stanza is stating that suchness lies beyond the purview of language and thought. You know, that essentially we cannot know it in its true nature in terms of that until we have that direct insight. But nonetheless, we can talk about it, we can give some shape to it in terms of our conceptualization. So each of these have a different flavor of that to them to some degree. The fourth characteristic, we had it as devoid of conceptualization, uh, not conceptualized is what they used in Ocean of Reasoning. And, and it says here, conceptualization is the wandering of the mind. When one realizes the way things really are, one is free from that. Uh, now this, the part where it says, when one realizes the way things really are, um, Geshe Tenzin Temple in his commentary says that that's referring to a Buddha because it's really not only until you achieve Buddhahood that you have ever, always present the understanding of the way things really are. Until that time, up until you become a Buddha, when you've developed your Arya wisdom at the path of seeing and you continue on, you do have a mind free of conceptualization when emptiness is appearing to you directly. But once you come out of that meditative equipoise, conceptualization returns. You know, you, and it's only a Buddha's mind that is completely free of conceptualization. 
So anyway, this is a uh, one idea in regard to that. Um, another way of talking about the characteristics of emptiness. It, it's at to the Arya beings. It's not conceptualized. There's no conceptualization around it. And certainly to a Buddha, when one has fully mastered that, there's never even a conceptual thought. The Buddha doesn't know phenomena conceptually. Um, in fact, all the things that are uh, dependently uh, designated in the world through conceptualization are only known through the Buddha knowing the minds of beings who designate phenomena as such. Because there's no inherent existently pheno existent phenomenon to be known. So the Buddha doesn't know a chair directly in a sense because a chair is merely imputed by beings who designate that as chair. So there's no chair kind of from its own side to be known. So the Buddha is only knowing things through the minds of beings that conceptualize phenomena. Whereas the Buddha's mind is knowing all phenomena or kind of having that uh, non-conceptual wisdom that is embracing uh, all phenomena th in that way. The fifth characteristic we had is not differentiated. And in uh, the translation of Ocean of Reasoning, they gave the term without distinctions. And the description there says just as one phenomenon is ultimately, is ultimately, so are all other phenomena. Therefore, ultimately, there is no individuality. This is kind of that idea of everything being of one taste and emptiness, right? So at the level of emptiness, we can't differentiate between chair and table and person and anything else because at the level of emptiness, they're all of one taste. We're talking about a negation, a negation of inherent existence. And because there's nothing from the side of those phenomena that indicate what they are, there's really no differentiation other than through conceptual designation. It's only that conceptually that we designate things as such on the basis of what we've determined through our conventional agreement to call certain things, to designate certain things as chairs, tables, and what have you. So then there's a little quote from the Satyadvayadvatara Sutra, which says, O Manjushri, what is perfect engagement? Manjushri said, O oh, son of a god, just as reality, the nature of phenomena, the completely non-arisen are ultimately equal, so are the uninterrupted. So meaning that kind of everything is in the meditative equipoise, you know, completely the same. There's really no differentiation of phenomena at that point because one is only knowing their emptiness. Uh, this passage continues extensively, Tsongkhapa says, thus, these five facts are the five characteristics of the way things really are. One should also understand that each subsequent one explains its predecessor. I, I had a hard time with that because I didn't really get any commentary that demonstrated that. But each w subsequent one seems to in, in some way elaborate on what came before it. But anyway, I'm not sure again that I can speak much more to that. So those are the characteristics of how things really are. What is the, you know, what does ultimate analysis find in terms of the emptiness from the Arya's meditative equipoise? or from an Arya Buddha's wisdom. In other words, how, how is it that that emptiness is known? As again, not being dependent upon another, it's only through one's own wisdom, uh, pacified, tranquil from any of those uh, elaborations of true existence, uh, not fabricated by any mental elaboration, uh, any uh, clinging to inherent existence with regard to that, uh, devoid of any conceptualization, which we again saw as um, any sort of um, designation of things through a conceptual mind. And then fifth, uh, seeing everything undifferentiated, you know, that there's no distinction between the emptiness of one phenomenon and the emptiness of other and all of other phenomena. So this is the first part of this outline. Now we go on to the characteristics of things as they really are according to ordinary people. Now again, it's not to say that all ordinary people realize what's in this verse number 10. Because if they realize that, they'd be on their way to realizing emptiness because it talks about their dependent origination. But nonetheless, there is still some conventional knowledge about how things do come into existence. So this is more like kind of the, the dependent arising side of it, whereas for the aria in meditative equipoise, it's understanding the emptiness side of it very clearly. So now in terms of the characteristics of the way things really are, we're looking at dependent arising. We get into chapter 24, we get into that explanation, which is a really amazing chapter about how dependent arising is the meaning of emptiness. That these two, once more, are kind of the two sides of the same coin, and you never have one without the other. And so this verse, we'll go ahead and read it shortly, is essentially giving us the point of view of two beings who uh, even can engage in that type of investigation. They can see 
the dependent arising of things, particularly in regard to their causes and conditions. So let's read verse 10 together now. Whatever comes into being in dependence on another is not identical with that thing. Since it is not different from that thing either, it is neither non-existent nor permanent. Once more, recall that dependent arising is the reasoning that the Buddha says, Buddha calls this the king of reasonings. Why? Because it helps us to find that middle way between the two extremes. The extremes of non-existence, where we annihilate things on the basis of seeing that if they lack inherent existence, they don't have any existence at all. This will be the starting point for chapter 24 when we get into debates that are raised, uh, points that are raised by objectors who say, well, if you say things don't exist inherently, well, then nothing exists because there can't be anything that exists if it doesn't exist inherently. You can't equate the two. Inherent existence doesn't mean mere existence. Mere existence can still be upheld, although we refute inherent existence. So that extreme of non-existence that's mentioned in our final line there, uh, things being neither non-existent nor permanent, meaning kind of having an unchanging, stable reality to them, which is what we think things have now. We think that they exist independently on their own, you know, capable of setting themselves up. So we are already in that extreme. We have to dial away from that extreme to find the middle way and not fall into the precipice of uh, nihilism, you know, negating things as existing at all. So this verse kind of gives us this idea of how things come into being. We're primarily talking about things that arise from causes and conditions. We can use the example that I mentioned last week, I think, I think it was last week of a, a seed and a sprout. So we can call the seed the cause of the sprout, right? You know, and if you have a, a plant that, you know, this from the seed, a sprout rises, then we can talk about its production in terms of it not being produced inherently. It's not produced from something that is identical to it, the same as it, because its production would be unnecessary then, because you'd already have the sprout existing at the time of the seed. It also can't be inherently different from it, because otherwise you could never have a continuum of seed giving rise to the sprout, because they'd be inherently different, therefore unrelatedly different, therefore never any sort of causal process involved at all. So we find that inherent production of things cannot occur Instead, things arise in dependence upon causes and conditions that are neither inherently the same nor inherently different. Therefore, you don't fall into either extreme because it's not that the seed is completely annihilated at the time when the sprout arises in, in an inherent way because the seed has given rise to the sprout. Its nature has transformed into what we call a sprout. And it's not that they are, again, uh, completely identical, inherently the same. So we can't kind of find some sort of inherent existence in there, nor do we find any kind of complete annihilation. We're able to uphold this middle way view between these two extremes. So let me read a little bit. There's not very much for Tsongkhapa's commentary on this, just a couple of paragraphs. Um, Tsongkhapa says, any effect that arises in dependence on a cause cannot be inherently identical to that cause because the absurd consequence would follow that all agents of arising and those to which they give rise would be identical. You know, if, if it's inherently the same, then they'd be identical and you'd have no purpose for arising happening at all because it already has occurred. It's already there in the cause. If the result is identical to the cause, the whole process of arising wouldn't make any sense. It would already be existing there. Of course, most people don't believe that that happens, right? You wouldn't, wouldn't say to somebody, you know, uh, I'd like to buy a bag of apple trees, you know, go to the store. You know, you want to get a bag of seeds that you could use to make apple trees because you understand that there's a causal process. But most people do fall prey to thinking that things are inherently different because they hold to its identity as a seed as being independently existing, inherently existing, even when they can see the transformation of that seed into a sprout because they will hold the sprout to be inherently existing. Once more, because every phenomenon that appears to us through our senses as well as our mental consciousness appears to inherently exist. It's uh, the uh, imprints of, uh, in, of the ignorance adhering to inherent existence are on our minds that cause this is these knowledge obscurations that cause everything to appear as if they exist on their own independently. 
So we you know, can certainly say that ordinary beings this is where it's an interesting title to this according to ordinary people. Ordinary people don't do this type of analysis, right? They just take things for what they are because they appear that way, they adhere to it. But nonetheless, this is non trying to give us a feeling for dependent arising, dependent origination, which is how all conventional phenomena exist. It is, it's even how emptiness exists because there is nothing whatsoever that is not a dependent arising. Therefore, there is nothing that is not empty. And that's actually a paraphrase of a verse we're going to see coming up in chapter 24. So Tsongkhapa Sonka goes on to say, therefore, there is no permanence in the sense that the effect just is the cause which has been transformed. So there's no kind of permanence carrying over of the complete identity of the seed to the sprout. Otherwise, we'd, we wouldn't designate them differently, right? If they were inherently the same, there would be no different just designation. We just say, oh, seed, 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 as it goes through a whole process. Instead, we designate it differently because there is uh, not a permanent, unchanging, eternal quality to that, uh, independently existing. Nor, nor is any effect that arises in dependence on a cause inherently different from that cause. So this is the other side of it. It's not inherently the same, nor is it inherently different because its dependence on the cause would be inconsistent with its difference. So it depending upon it in the way that a sprout depends upon the seed would be inconsistent with that because they are inherently different. They're utterly different. They wouldn't be able to have that type of a relationship. Consequently, it would follow that it would arise causelessly because if, if it can arise from something that is inherently other that is the seed, it can arise from anything that is inherently other because there's, there doesn't need to, there won't be any overlay between these two. So again, things do arise in this process of not being inherently the same and not being inherently different. And he goes on to say, therefore, there is no annihilation of the continuum of the cause in virtue of the effect not arising from a cause. So the idea is, is that you don't have permanence in terms of something carrying over in an eternal way, on, in an unchanging way, nor do you have annihilation in that once more, the seed being completely, utterly annihilated in, in an inherent way while the sprout gives rise or comes into existence. Rather, once more, we see a continuum of things. Yeah, and this is mostly talking, again, from the point of view of what we call um, impermanent phenomena, phenomena that do arise from causes and conditions. Um, but dependent arising, as we spoke earlier, uh, one of the earlier classes can also refer to that subtlest way that all phenomena, even emptiness itself, which as I mentioned a short while ago, is merely imputed, merely designated on a basis. So dependent arising at its coarsest level is uh, de uh, depending upon causes and conditions. But even when we analyze causes and conditions, we see that it points to the same reality, that we really only have phenomena that are merely imputed seed being merely imputed to a state of that basis when it's not yet germinated, and then sprout when that has broken through and we have what we call a sprout. And we could designate any other number of things in there. You could designate when the sprout part of it is like that much, then we might call it, you know, whatever, you know, give it another name. You know, it's all up to us to impute these things, to designate them. There's nothing from the side of the object. It's just going through its biological process whatever, you know, bot botanical process in this case. So. so then there's a second paragraph in this. It says, therefore, reasoning in terms of dependent origination shows that cause and effect are neither essentially identical nor essentially different. This argument then shows that this position is also free of the errors of reification and nihilism with respect to causes. Besides cause and effect, this also should be understood as the way to dispel both reification and nihilism and essentially existent identity and difference in all dependently designated phenomena. So it's not just those that are produced, but again, all phenomena are dependently designated. Therefore, if we, if we find that middle way that actually points to how things actually exist in a, in a conventional way, we are free of the two extremes because we are not declaring something to be inherently identical to its cause or to its basis or anything else that we are involved in in terms of the analysis, nor is it inherently different. And again, if we talk about the level of mere designation, we can say that you know, the label book and what I have in my hand, which is the basis of designation for book, are not inherently different nor inherently the same, right? 
because if they were inherently different, then I wouldn't have anything in my hand that would be related to the label book. But if they were inherently different, then there'd be no relationship between the two, right? So even at the level of mere designation, we can see that identical or different cannot be inherent. They are conventionally different in that book is a label we give to this stuff that's in my hand that is the basis of designation for book. But that's only at a, at a relative you know, level. When we come to an ultimate analysis, we find that they cannot be inherently different. They're only relatively different, you know, nominally different. Does this make some sense? So this is how everything exists, is that there is no inherent I I identity or identicalness, whatever they, they would use the term identity here, but an essentially existent or inherently existent identity, nor inherently existent difference between causes and effects, between uh, the label and what is labeled, the basis of designation, between the whole and its parts. These things arise in, as dependent arisings. We have uh, them related to each other but not inherently the same, nor inherently different. Otherwise, that relationship would fall apart. Okay. Let's go on then to verse 11. We're now moving into uh, one of the next sections, which is the conclusion in a sense. We do have like another little kind of um, bit that Tsongkhapa added around confirmation by citations from definitive sutras around this. I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail. This is really the last outline of chapter 18 in terms of the verses. And it's called showing that one must practice this, which is again, uh, Nagarjuna in the original verses saying, okay, I've explained how to go about realizing the lack of a independently existent self on the basis of this person that we have imputed to the aggregates. I'm now going to give a bit of an admonishment about how this is what, what we have to practice. Yeah. This is what we actually have to realize. So let's read verse uh, 11 that starts this section. By the Buddhas, saviors of the world, this immortal truth has been taught, not one, not differentiated, not non-existent, and not permanent. So we see a repetition of what we just saw in terms of it's not one, you don't have inherent sameness or identity, nor is it not inherently different, completely, utterly, uh, independently different. It's also not non-existent, meaning we avoid the extreme of annihilation. And we also avoid the extreme of reification by saying it's not permanent. It's not eternal and unchanging. So we have all of it, if we find this exact way that the Buddha and all the saviors of the world have taught, then we see that it's free of all of those extremes. It's not inherently the same, not inherently different, not utterly non-existent, not uh, inherently existent. So let's go on to then look at what Tsongkhapa says. We're now on to page 388. Um, here it says, the Buddha, the protector of the world and patron of the helpless, I guess we can call ourselves the helpless, he's our patron, has taught the perfect doctrine, the nectar, cutting off aging and death once and for all. Recall that aging and death is the last of the 12 links, right? And it brings forth, of course, the first link, by virtue of if every time we die, we die with our ignorance, we then come into this life and through the force of our ignorance, create more actions and so on. So essentially it cuts off aging and death once and for all, uh, this perfect doctrine. This doctrine, as has been previously explained, illuminates the profound meaning of the ultimate, that dependently arisen, dependently designated phenomena are neither inherently identical nor different. Of course, he means inherently for both of those, inherently identical, nor inherently different, nor annihilated, nor permanent. Thus, one should exert great effort to obtain this nectar. Um, and then he then has in this version, verse 12 there, but actually in the actual Tibetan from what uh, they said at the, in Italy when they studied this with Geshe Tenzin Temple, that actually comes in later. Um, so he goes on to say the Shravakas. The Shravakas are... Uh, this is a Sanskrit word that means the hearers. Uh, recall that there are three main paths. The Bodhisattva path is the one we mostly focus on in this tradition. But there are what are called the Shravakas, the hearers, and the Pratyeka Buddhas, which are the solitary realizers. They say there are two types of, of practitioners who engage in the, Mahi, in the Hinayana path, the individual vehicle, that are intent upon achieving their own liberation. So the hearers are called such because they say that they hear the Mahayana doctrine, but they don't necessarily follow it. 
they are intent upon their own liberation, but they congregate and are part of communities and what have you, sanghas and that, and they achieve enlightenment uh, in terms of the lesser vehicle or the individual vehicle. So they really only achieve uh, their own liberation. They don't achieve full complete enlightenment that we are normally referring to as enlightenment in this tradition. Then there are what are called the Pratyeka Buddhas. They're going to come up actually in um, uh, verse 12. Pratyeka Buddhas are solitary realizers. They say these are practitioners who are at, like the hearers, are intent on their own liberation. But unlike the hearers, they have this wish to be able to achieve their own uh, liberation uh, in, a, in their last life before they achieve that in a place where no Buddhas exist, kind of on their own in a solitary thing. And there are even some of them that are non-congregating, they call them like the rhinoceros-like solitary realizers that don't congregate with other practitioners quite so much. And um, they do this, they say, it's kind of interesting. It's Holiness the Dalai Lama has talked about this. You might think they do this out of some sort of pride, thinking that, oh, I'm going to do it on my own without depending on you kind of thing. But they actually want to be in a world where there aren't any other Buddhists so that when they achieve their liberation, they can teach in a variety of ways to the beings who are there. So His Holiness has actually pointed out they, they ha seem to have more compassion, perhaps, than the hearers, but not as much compassion as the bodhisattvas because they don't want to go the full distance to achieve Buddhahood. They simply want to achieve their own liberation, but yet they don't want their liberation to be utterly meaningless because they want to be able to teach for the remainder of that life before they exit and pass into their solitary peace. So, so this starts off with talking about the shravakas, engage with the nectar, the way phenomena really are, of course, meaning the teachings on emptiness, through practicing hearing, contemplation, and meditation in that order. Recall that these are the three wisdoms, the three levels of wisdom begins with hearing or listening, which can also be not just, you know, hearing somebody go blah, blah, blah about the teachings, but reading the teachings, doing whatever one can to bring the teachings in, and then contemplating them, actually spending time reflecting on them, which is what most of our analytical meditation is, unless you develop really deep meditative skill. And then finally, the wisdom that arises through meditation, which is when you do have a very stable meditation and concentration, you can then penetrate more deeply into the wisdom of uh, various phenomena, especially here, the wisdom of emptiness it's mentioned. So they do that in that order, by hearing, contemplating, meditating on the way phenomena really are. That's how they engage with the nectar, those on the hearer path. Because according to Prasangika Madhyamika, which again is the consequence middle way school that Nagarjuna essentially set out, though Chandrakirti and Buddha Palita and other folks elaborated on it to make it quite, quite clear. Um, nonetheless, that view holds that hearers and solitary realizers have to realize the same emptiness that bodhisattvas do in order to achieve their liberation. If you ever get the chance to study the Tenets course, uh, you'll find out that all the other schools that are below Prasangika Madhyamaka, even Svatantrika Madhyamaka, which is the other school of, of the Middle Way, say that it's a different realization that hearers and solitary realizers, a coarser realization that they realize in order to achieve their liberation. It's only in the Prasangika Madhyamaka that, and Tsongkhapa goes into this in great detail in uh, his commentary on Chandrakirti's supplement to the Middle Way, that in according to the Prasangika Vinyamika view, hearers and solitary realizers realize the same emptiness. They have to realize the same emptiness in order to be free from samsara, in order to achieve their own nirvana. So anyway, this is the idea that this is how shravakas engage in this. And he said, they enjoy the nectar of the three trainings, the three trainings being, he called it here propriety, which we would call morality, meditative stabilization or concentration, and wisdom and thereby will attain nirvana, eliminating aging and death. Nevertheless, even though one might have heard this nectar of the Dharma, if in virtue of the roots of virtue not having yielded their fruit, one does not attain nirvana in this life, one will certainly attain it in future lives through the power of previous causes. So it's just, he's going into this little thing to elaborate on the verse that's coming, uh, verse 12. But essentially, if one you know, begins that practice and doesn't complete it in that lifetime, they will have an opportunity to continue that path through the force of the causes they've created in that life. Things don't go to waste, right? This is one of the principles of karma, that all the actions we engage in are not wasted. So everything we do has some positive 
repercussion. Even though, if even if we're not able to achieve liberation or enlightenment in this life, it will carry forward. And there's a quote then from the 400 stanzas of Arya Deva, which says, "If having realized this, one does not achieve liberation here." one will in a future life without effort definitely achieve it just like de determinate, determinate karma or definite karma. One might think that if one, this is some kappa continuing, one might think that if one encounters someone in another life who can teach one the way things really are, that might happen. But since it is not certain that one will encounter someone like that in the future life, it is not certain that nirvana will be achieved in another life. So the idea here is, is that we've come into contact with these teachings right now. <laughs> in this life, we come into contact with these precious nectar of the Dharma of emptiness. So we have no guarantee that we're gonna come into contact with a teacher of this in the future. So this is the life to actually take hold of it. Even though there is this quote that shows that the Shravakas who do engage teach in the teachings quite fully, they'll plant the seeds to be able to get liberation in that life or in future lives. We have to do that, something similar. We have to actually take these teachings quite seriously. But nonetheless, there will still be some opportunities to come in contact with these teachings, as is explained in verse 12. So let's read that verse. This is actually where, according to when Geshe Temple taught it, uh, the actual verse shows up in the Tibetan. So let's read verse 12 now. When the fully awakened ones do not appear, and even the Shravakas have disappeared, the wisdom of the self-enlightened ones will arise completely without reliance on others. So the self-enlightened ones, it's kind of interesting that they put shravakas in that translation, Geshe uh, Tukten Jimpa, uh, but nonetheless, they didn't leave Prateka Buddha there. <laughs> Prateka Buddha often is translated as the self-enlightened ones, uh, those solitary realizers who make that decision to um, achieve their liberation in a, in a realm, a world where there aren't any Buddhas present. So let's look at how Tsongkhapa then explains this verse. He says, but one will there, thereby definitely attain nirvana because although in the other life, the Buddhas who constitute the condition of awakening do not arise in the world and shravakas are gone, just as we saw in the first two lines of our verse, the wisdom of the Pratyeka Buddhas will be obtained independently without relying on or seeking a spiritual friend and without a community. So he says, these are the explanations of how great things can be achieved by followers of the lesser vehicle. This, for those who follow the great vehicle, serves as an eye for seeing other paths leading to the city of liberation. So it helps us to understand that there are other ways that people can still attain their own nirvana, their liberation. Once one attains nirvana, one merits the title perfected. And he goes on to um, talk about a, a couple of quotes, uh, one from the uh, Sanchai, Sanchaya Gata Sutra, which says, uh, how could billions of blind people without a guide reach a city without knowing the road? Similarly, even with the other five perfections, but without wisdom, without that eye, how could one reach enlightenment? When a person is well equipped with wisdom, then he achieves the eye and thereby he merits that title. So the idea here is, is that without the wisdom realizing emptiness, the other five perfections that one engages in on the path to enlightenment are blind. They cannot possibly get to the result without the eye of wisdom that will accompany them on that journey. Then he says, since this point is so important that even if one has a doubt regarding whether things are really like that, it must be regarded as significant. Once more in Arya Davis' uh, 400 stanzas, it says, those with little merit do not even entertain questions regarding this dharma. Even entertaining a question about it tears cyclic existence to shreds or even having a doubt about it. So I don't know, this, this little commentary on this, it's kind of interesting. It's hard to put it all together into one solid idea. But the, the point is, is that there, there, we have to trust in this sort of nectar of the Dharma that shows us the path of emptiness. And understand that, yes, we will, as long as we keep creating the causes and conditions, it will ripen eventually into our full realization and consequently, eventually, liberation and enlightenment. So finally, the one more little bit here, it says, uh, one should seek this profound inner meaning and having sought it, exert effort in its contemplation. Just as the wise Bodhisattva, Sada Prarudita, does everyone remember who Sada Prarudita is? He's the Bodhisattva always crying. He said, 
he, he, he was born into a life and he wanted to find his guru from his past lives and he couldn't find him. So he was always crying, waiting to hear, you know, to meet his precious guru and eventually did, but nonetheless. Um, anyway, having the wisdom to see its benefits. He's also, I guess, renowned for having seen the benefits of the teachings on emptiness, sacrificed his life, seeking the perfection of wisdom. So then there's one more verse from uh, Arya Davis 400 stanzas, which, which says, when one sees reality, one achieves the supreme abode. Even by seeing the slightest bit, one is better off. Therefore, the wise should always cultivate such wisdom in order to contemplate the inner phenomena. So this verse, again, was in this outline that had to do with this idea of encouraging us to continue this investigation of emptiness, encouraging us to do whatever we can to realize that uh, as quickly as possible um, and take advantage of what we have in this life, having met with this profound Dharma. As I said, there's one more little section that's called a confirmation by citations from definitive sutras. Um, and nonetheless, he doesn't, he just re reassures that there are passages that indicate exactly what he's explained, you know, that he, doesn't go and elaborate on them so much. There's one sutra passage, which has about, I don't know, seven or eight verses that he does quote, that's on page 390. And I'm not gonna read all of that, but essentially he's just saying, you know, know that what I have set out here is in line with the definitive sutras. Uh, as he says here, the ex this explanation of the essencelessness of the self and of being mine is presented by the sutras cited above, as well as in many other profound sutras. Their meaning is presented in brief by this chapter. It is said that by familiarizing oneself with it, one can eliminate all faults. Therefore, one should understand the approach to engaging with the way things are as it is found in all of the sutras in which the profound meaning is stated, just as it is, just as it is presented here. Recall that again, for the Prasangika Vinyamakas, uh, this middle way consequence school, they say that the differentiation between what is definitive sutra and what is interpretable sutra has to do with whether it's about the topic of emptiness or not. And they mean emptiness of inherent existence. So essentially everything that is a, a, a definitive sutra is that which delineates emptiness as it is explained in this final view. Everything else is interpretive, meaning that we do still have to understand the teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the teachings on karma, the teachings on rebirth, the teachings on everything else through the lens of it being merely designated, having no inherent existence to be upheld because it is still part of the reality of dependent arising. Doesn't mean that we discount the, the karma teachings or the Four Noble Truths in, in some way because uh, they're not teaching on emptiness. It just means that we have to take them within the understanding that there are no inherently existent true sufferings. There are no inherently existent uh, true origins, therefore no inherently existent karma, therefore no inherently existent afflictions. But the Buddha didn't talk about them in that light when he talked about them in those sutras, he just presented them as part of conventional reality and only in the definitive sutras did he actually talk about their actual nature in terms of emptiness. So I'm, that's all I'm gonna say on uh, chapter 18, I think, unless there are any other comments or questions. Let's go ahead and open it up now. It's about 7.43 or so. Were there any questions from anyone elsewhere online? Any questions in the room? Yes, Amy. What's the definition of nirvana? The definition of nirvana. Um, I mean, I usually describe it as the, as the complete pacification of all the afflictive obstructions, the state of being in, the state of having pacified all of the afflictive obstructions. Um, does it include bodhicitta and compassion? Well, it obviously includes all the other realizations that one has developed up to that point. I mean, when we talk about nirvana, it gets hard because there are different classifications of nirvana even. When we talk about non-abiding nirvana, well, then that's different than just a general nirvana. But for those who have completed the Hinayana path, the individual vehicle, the state that they attain that we call nirvana is the way I described it, a complete pacification of all the afflictive obstructions. They have certainly developed some levels of compassion because in the Hinayana path, you also meditate on the four immeasurables and all these other things. They probably, if they're Hinayana practitioners, they haven't developed bodhicitta yet, at least to, to the degree that has caused them to enter into the Mahayana vehicle. 
because that is the entry point to the Mahayana, is having un spontaneous or uncontrived bodhicitta. Can you explicitly say that? Like, we're not after confession? I mean, it's just like, it's like a slap in the face. Right. So, again, I think most people may have heard the question online, but the question of um, do they do they really kind of perceive themselves in that way, or, or would they? Will they admit it? Yeah. I mean, not... Will they admit it? Will they? Again, I think that again, the Buddha taught both paths as valid paths. So it's not that it gets into like a comparison thing, like, you know, how much compassion do you have versus how much do I have? Or have, have you gotten bodhicitta yet? Well, well, you haven't. Well, I don't want to, you know, associate with you or something. Rather, the idea is, is that people do have different predispositions. There can be some people, they use the analogy of if you wanted to get um, everyone to a very, very distant island, you may have some people have the fortitude to do the journey all in one swoop. But there are a lot of people who maybe need to be told, oh, well, we can just go to this other island that's maybe not quite as far away. And they, they happily do that. Then when they arrive at that island, which is kind of like being in the city of liberation or nirvana, they've attained their kind of own pacification of their afflictions. Then they're told at that point, oh, but we still have a little bit more journey. And then they, they can feel refreshed and recharged and able to get back on the boat and make the rest of the journey to the final destination. And again, it's not, it's not to say that we in any way deprecate people because of that. It's simply a predisposition. It's just, you know, and, and again, there, there may be people, I would imagine, because again, the, the Buddha himself taught both the Mahayana and the Hinayana in the duration of his 45 years. There were people in the room, just like these hearers that I was talking about, that hear the Mahayana Dharma. But don't, don't necessarily practice it. They can say, "Well, oh, those are really pretty profound teachings. I, I'm not quite there yet, but those I really, you know, can admire them and feel some faith in them. But don't feel that it's their path to follow." So I don't know. I mean, we don't want to get into. I, every person is a unique individual too. It's not like when we classify them in this that everyone's identical as a hearer, as a solitary realizer, as a bodhisattva. Sure, but compassion is very different from bodhicitta. You know, we can say compassion is the seed of bodhicitta, and then when it's developed as great compassion, which is not just the mere compassion that most of us have, but it's a compassion that wants to protect all beings from suffering, then that becomes the seed for bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is not just the compassionate wish to protect all beings from suffering, but it's joined with the aspiration to become a Buddha to do that. So it, it, it advances as one goes through all these different iterations. All of those on the individual vehicle path, though, as I said, they meditate on the four measurables and cultivate them. They've got this amazing compassion for all beings. They just don't feel once more the compulsion or the sense of self-responsibility to go the extra distance of the bodhisattva path at that time. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, Stephen, were you going to? the accompanying thoughts yeah right so what's what Stephen was pointing out and it's very true I mean it's the everyone can have kind of equal compassion in some regard but it's the accompanying thoughts that go with that as you pointed out the special attitude that one has to say and I will take responsibility for doing that for all beings I'm not going to leave it to someone else to do that I'm going to do that so it's just an advancement of the compassionate thought to the sense of full responsibility, the special, you know, altruistic resolve that bodhisattvas make to go that full distance. And again, it can depend upon so many factors, you know, one's own karma and what have you. It's not that, again, there's any sort of denigration of people. It's just simply where people are at. I mean, you might have people in a similar way 
that enter into medical school who decide to become perhaps, you know, medical assistants or whatever and don't want to go the full distance of becoming a doctor, you know, or a surgeon or something like that. You know, people can choose perhaps, you know, different ways to practice in the medical field that are in line with their predisposition. I don't want to go that, that far because I don't feel whatever the inclination to do so, I don't feel like I want to take on all of that, whatever the case might be. But we wouldn't denigrate them because they're all making their own choices about how to contribute to the field of medicine. And they're all worthy of, you know, praise on the basis of that. So even the, the Buddha, again, he, because he taught the Hinayana path, he taught it for those who aren't yet able to take on that burden, that extra special resolve, but still will have amazing compassion for beings. And again, it doesn't mean that they don't engage, engage in compassionate acts or they don't engage in generosity or any of the other perfections. They just don't, it can't be called perfections because they aren't on the bodhisattva path. They aren't together with bodhicitta. They would be called a practice of generosity, a practice of morality, a practice of patience, what have you. And I'm guessing that again, many of us who <laughs> purport to be on the Mahayana path have a lot less compassion than many of the people who are on the Hinayana path. So don't, don't get into kind of, again, a, any kind of superiority with this at all. That's why I really like Robert Thurman having gotten rid of the sense of what maha and hina mean, which are greater and lesser, and saying universal and individual. I mean, and that already smacks perhaps of a little more of, oh, I've got the universal responsibility. Well, you only have an individual responsibility, but it's at least getting rid of some of this idea that one's better than the other. It's just simply a different predisposition. You know, and for bodhisattvas, as Stephen was pointing out in his comment, you know, solitary peace is and it is an extreme we don't want to fall into. We have the extreme of samsara that we have great fear of already because we practice our own renunciation and desire to be liberated and so on. But we also develop, bodhisattvas develop a fear of solitary peace because they see that succumbing to that, falling into that, means that one can't, can't continue one's path of benefiting others. So it's a good question. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Now, we really hadn't introduced these three practitioners prior to this. We talked about Hinayana and Mahayana in kind of a general way, but um, it does bring up those questions. I always still had the question, and I don't know that I've ever gotten a sufficient answer, as to they say that when they do check out into their solitary peace, that they sort of hang out in this kind of lotus in a pure land, and then eventually a Buddha stirs them from that and says, oh, you haven't done all the work yet. I'm going to encourage you to continue on the Mahayana path. I just had a lot of questions about how all that happens and what is the karma of that happening if there's they don't really have any karma that's like you know afflictive karma or anything but there must be something that keeps i don't know i kind of felt sorry for those practitioners at that level to kind of get that word just get oh my gosh you mean i still have to do a lot of work when they thought they had checked out i don't know any other questions comments yeah Gil. Okay. Uh, they're set out in the sutras. Um, you know, Gail's question was, how do we know these things? Again, and there, there is a, um, a stronger attention, if you will, to the hearer path, probably than in the solitary realizer one in the um, Hinayana traditions. But nonetheless, I mean, again, don't, even though we might look at this and say, well, we've got these Mahayana traditions of Zen and Chan Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism and so on. And then we point to like the Theravadans and want to call them Hinayana, but you can never tell what any one individual person's path is or what they're practicing. You can have bodhisattvas anywhere. You can have Buddhas even anywhere. So who knows what the realization of anyone else is. But all these things in terms of the structure of the three vehicles and so on are all set out in the sutras. I, which sutras, I couldn't tell you, but I know they're quoted in uh, the studies that I've done in the Abhisamaya Lamkara in particular, where it goes through that. Because the goal of a bodhisattva is to aid all beings, right? So you have to know how to aid hearers and solitary realizers and how to help them on their path. It says that the hearers, you know, primarily rely upon the general teachings, but the, the solitary realizers actually really like to engage in the 12 links of dependent origination. This is kind of their expertise and something that they really um, are quite uh, enamored of, I think. So, but anyway, all these things are set out in the sutras. I don't know if that I, I mean, who knows if they've even met a hearer, but much less a solitary realizer. I don't know. These sound kind of strange concepts when we look back, but, you know, perhaps 
uh, these folks are all still around practitioners of that. So let's go ahead and move forward for the remaining time. We've got about another 20 minutes and I wanna introduce chapter 24 and begin our investigation if we can, uh, talk a little bit about the structure of it. Um, chapter 24 is an examination of the Four Noble Truths. So once more, if we go back to the very beginning of this course, we talked about how um, in His Holiness's introduction, how he talked about kind of setting out to some degree a conventional presentation of how we are in this predicament that we are in, in chapter 26, in terms of the 12 links of dependent origination. Then looking at the wisdom of emptiness as it's presented in chapter 18 when we examine the self and other phenomena to some degree, but primarily the self, keeping in mind that the Nagarjuna prior to that was picking apart all phenomena and saying, you know, agent and action don't exist inherently and time doesn't exist inherently and all these other phenomena don't exist inherently. So he's, you know, taking one chapter in His Holiness's presentation, the one on, on the emptiness of the self and making that kind of the ultimate truth. So we've had conventional truth and ultimate truth. What we're going to do in chapter 24, which is His Holiness calls it perhaps the most important chapter of the text, is to show how these two work together in tandem with no contradiction that we can uphold conventional reality and its ultimate nature of emptiness without any problem that these don't these aren't two conflicting ideas but actually completely complementary so I'm going to read just the very beginning of what his holiness says in regard to this this is page 93 of the middle way book um, where he's introducing this chapter he says in Nagarjuna's treatise the 24th chapter, Examination of the Four Noble Truths, is uniquely important. In the chapters that precede it, Nagarjuna presented a series of related arguments, all intended to demolish, grasping at any form of intrinsic existence whatsoever. On the level of everyday perception, phenomena are manifold, diverse, you know, we have all the various things that exist. But on the ultimate level, all of them are revealed to be devoid of intrinsic existence. They all have that characteristic of emptiness. This argument regarding the emptiness of intrinsic existence of all phenomena can raise all sorts of doubts in the mind. And that's what we primarily start with is all the doubts. Will, as I said earlier, you know, if you say things lack intrinsic existence, well then there are no Four Noble Truths and there are no this and no that because people can equate it with mere existence which is a problem, right? Because then everything the Buddha taught wouldn't make any sense at all because to just simply negate everything, it wasn't, it wasn't a negation of everything. It was negation of a particular misconception that we have, an object that we are clinging to in regard to the self and all phenomena that needs to be removed if we are to know things as they really are, if we are to be free of everything that plagues us by virtue of that ignorance. So that's all I wanted to read from there. I think it's just kind of a nice way to set up what we're doing. When we start off this chapter, we are gonna get into this idea of these um, arguments that are put forth, uh, objections that are put forth. And that's gonna be about the first six verses or so. And then we're gonna have the reply. And essentially that is the outline for the whole text or for this whole chapter is the objection and everything else is a reply. <laughs> from verse seven all the way to the very last verse of this, um, which is verse uh, 40, it's a bit of a long chapter, is a way for Nagarjuna to expound upon how these two can be upheld without any problem, that the faults that the objector is seeing in terms of intrinsic existence, negating the mere existence of things, that this is not a fault that accrues to Nagarjuna at all, because the view of Madhyamika Prasangika is able to uphold the two truths simultaneously. You know, that we don't have any problem with saying things lack inherent existence, and yet they exist. Albeit as mere designations, mere imputations, but that's good enough. That's good enough for existence. We don't need anything more than that. Anything more than that is to be refuted because it doesn't exist. I always talk about how the comforting thing is that things have always existed this way. It's not like, you know, it's that we are coming to know reality as it has always existed. And it's functioned perfectly fine. I mean, it hasn't produced the results that we wanted because we've been in samsara since beginningless time. It hasn't functioned to bring about our peace, our liberation, our enlightenment, but it can if we move in that direction. We're never negating the functionality of things. We're never negating their mere existence. The Buddha never did that. To things that didn't exist at all, sure, the Buddha would refute their existence. If you cannot find the basis for it, well, then 
like the Atman, as I mentioned some classes ago, that is taught by the Vedic traditions, the Buddha would say no such phenomenon exists. There is anatman, there is no soul that one can find that is the basis for this concept. This is an, in, uh, an acquired concept. We have to be taught this again. So the Buddha did refute some phenomena as existent at all, but in terms of everything that does exist, he holds, upholds their existence. He agrees with worldly convention and allows us to designate things as we wish, as we do so in agreement. And then he says, yes, that's, that exists, but it doesn't exist in the way that it appears. It doesn't exist in the way that beings think it does. It's merely designated, merely imputed, and therefore lacks inherent existence. And those two, once more, can be held up, uh, inextricably bound up with each other, as I mispronounced last week, and Stephen came to the rescue. So, so let's go ahead and look at the objections. And I'm going to go through these rather quickly, if maybe even finish them tonight, if we've got time. Uh, His Holiness doesn't spend much time on the objections at all, because they're, they're essentially the same thing, just in regard to different bases. So let's look at the very first verse, which is the first part of this objection. If all of this is empty, neither arising nor disintegrating, then for you it follows that the four noble truths do not exist. So these are the words in the mouth of an objector. These are not Nagarjuna saying this. This is not the truth coming from Nagarjuna's wisdom. This is the, the, the conclusion that somebody who's been not paying attention so well <laughs> to Nagarjuna's teachings is coming out with and objecting to, saying if everything is empty, neither arising nor disintegrating, then for you, it follows that the Four Noble Truths do not exist. You know, then it follows for you that all these other things don't exist. Why? Because if you tell me that they don't arise and don't disintegrate, and, you know, and again, they're equating inherent existence with mere existence, then nothing can be upheld. If by refuting inherent existence, you refute the mere existence of phenomena, these things can't exist. Makes sense to, for someone to say that. And in fact, all once more of the lower schools, everybody below Prasangika and Yamaka would hold this to some degree. That if we, if we are annihilating through our view, inherent existence, getting rid of that, then things can't be upheld. Of course, if they investigate further and really come to understand the reasonings that Nagarjuna is doing and that Chandrakirti did and that all these great masters did to help elucidate the meaning of emptiness, then they will get it. That's how actually how we get to the first rebuttal. The very first verse says essentially, you don't understand the meaning of emptiness. You don't understand what emptiness is. You don't understand the purpose of emptiness. You've misunderstood the whole thing. You know, hate to tell you, you know, these objectors haven't really taken it to heart, haven't really done the deeper investigation. If they did, they wouldn't be making such strange objections. So let me read what uh, uh, Tsongkhapa has on this. He says, suppose someone argued as follows. If you argue that all internal and external phenomena are empty of inherent existence, then you would commit many major errors. How does this go? If things were empty, they would be non-existent. Therefore, like the son of a barren woman, they would not arise and would not cease. You know, you wouldn't, they wouldn't exist at all. Just like the progeny of a woman who's barren. If she's been barren all of her life, she cannot give birth to any children. So without arising and cessation, then for you who assert that things are empty, the absurd consequence would follow that the four noble truths do not exist. This is because the five appropriated aggregates to which previous causes give rise instantiate the truth of suffering. But if there were no arising or cessation at all, they would not exist. So we cannot have the truth of suffering. If the appropriated aggregates cannot exist in the face of this wisdom of emptiness, well then you wouldn't have the truth of suffering by virtue of having these appropriated aggregates. If the truth of suffering did not exist, that was the first noble truth, the afflictions and actions, the origins from which the suffering aggregates arise would not exist. If the result doesn't exist, well then the cause for it can't exist. And if there were no suffering, there would be no truth of cessation in virtue of which suffering ceases right? Because if there was no suffering to begin with, how can you have a true cessation of the suffering? The third noble truth, gone like the wind, okay? Number four, um, and if there were no cessation of suffering, there could be no truth of the path, the eightfold path which leads to that cessation. And if that were the case, no four noble truths. 
So he's essentially, again, because of the initial mistake that's being made of equating the lack of inherent existence with the lack of any existence, this whole thing falls apart then. I mean, the Buddha never, again, taught that. It's just that this is a misunderstanding of the view of emptiness. Let's go on to verse two then, which is talked about next. If the four noble truths do not exist, then knowledge, abandonment, cultivation, and actualization are all untenable. These are the four actions that the Buddha taught in the very first sutra that he gave. The very first discourse is the Four Noble Truths Sutra. He said, true sufferings are to be known. True origins are to be abandoned. True cessations are to be cultivated. And true paths are to be actualized. These are the activities that the Buddha was encouraging in the, that first teaching, that we, how we engage in the Four Noble Truths. Okay, so if the Four Noble Truths don't exist, then all those actions are untenable of how you would engage in them. So the commentary on this from Tsongkhapa says, it would follow that neither the complete understanding of suffering, nor the abandonment of the origin of suffering, nor the meditation or cultivation on the path, nor the realization of cessation would be tenable. This is because, actually that, that's true. I mean, I think I, I, I flipped those. Cultivation of the path, it should have been for the fourth noble truth. They, they put them in a different order and actualization of um, cessation. But anyway, the idea is here is that if there were none of the four actions, such as cultivation of understanding or abandonment, then none of the four kinds of agent, such as the cultivator of understanding, would be tenable. And that is because agents are inextricably related to the actions that they do. So essentially, you're getting rid of like everything that the path is about, you know, any understanding we develop in regard to the Four Noble Truths, any of the practice of those, the practitioners of those, None of it can be upheld within this view of emptiness. Now there's an objection that stream enters and those who enjoy the fruits would not be tenable. Let's start that with verse three. Let's read that together. If these things do not exist, the four fruits also do not exist. Without the fruits, there is no one attainer of the fruits, nor are, they, are there those who enter the paths. So, I'm skipping a whole lot of the commentary on this because it gets into these four fruits, which they often talk about kind of the eight, um, eight um, what do they call them, the eight, uh, anyway, I missed them, the word kind of dropped out of my head. But you have four kind of um, indicators of progress on the path, especially they use these for hearers and solitary realizers. Stream enters, which mean those who have entered into the stream that leads out of, out of samsara into nirvana, who have attained the path of seeing, but they generally don't have any of the other kind of uh, suppressions of some of the afflictions that the other practitioners do. Then you have um, once returners who will return one time after that existence before they achieve their liberation. And you have non-returners who will actually achieve liberation in that life. Both of those have a suppression through the deepening of their concentration of various levels of the afflictions that allow them to attain those greater results. Then you have finally the final fruit of the Hinayana path, which is the fruit of foe destroyer. So you have those that are the eight uh, sort of Sangha classifications within that are the four approachers to those results and the four abiders in those results. And so again, I'm not gonna get into all the technical stuff of this because it gets elaborated upon into what are called the 20 Sangha and the, he doesn't do all of that in this commentary, but it's a, a, a teaching we had to go through in Abhisamayalamkara and, and I, I don't really wanna revisit it, frankly. <laughs> it was a pretty challenging teaching to understand all these various iterations of how people can go through all of this, depending upon what levels of concentration they develop and various lifetimes they've lived and all this other stuff. But know that there, this is essentially saying, okay, in the prior verse, we said there's no Four Noble Truths, nor are there any of these engaging in the Four Noble Truths. Therefore, you don't have any of the people that can engage in them and attain any of these four results, or even approach any of those four results, because those results don't exist, because the path doesn't exist, and so on. So Tsongkhapa says, since there would be nothing such as the understanding of suffering, what we just saw in the previous verse, the Four Fruits would not exist, you know? And he goes on to talk about all of these, and I'm going to just skip over that to the middle of the next page, 473. There's a one little paragraph. It says, without these four fruits, the enjoyers of those fruits, those four kinds of noble person who enjoy the fruits, would not exist. If they did not exist, 
the four kinds of path enters, those noble persons would not exist. So you couldn't have people entering into the various paths and what have you by virtue of the ones that are entering into those, you know, uh, pursuits on the path don't exist. So you, you essentially end up with uh, another kind of defeat in terms of if, if inherent existence is equivalent to, mere, equivalent to mere existence, then all of what the Buddha taught in terms of how one progresses on the path falls to the wayside because it can't possibly be upheld. It's untenable. Then, yes. Um, this argument is directed to the lower schools. Well, this is the lower schools, in a sense, coming yeah. with this argument to yeah. Prasangika Madhyamaka, yeah. saying, okay, you know, you, you just explain what emptiness is according to your tradition. If that's so, well, then, and again, they're equating it to mere existence. So then you have all these consequences. Yeah. True, true. So, so yeah, the comment then is, yeah, from the perspective of the people who are objecting here already do have some conviction in the Four Noble Truths and in the results of stream enter and so on. And, and so they, they're they already practitioners of the Buddha Dharma who say, you're going to defeat the whole Dharma if you hold this view, because when you, and by virtue of that, the Buddha and the Sangha, you know, we're seeing that in the next sec, set where we look at the three jewels are completely annihilated by virtue of this view. So yes, I mean, these are not the, the Joe on the street kind of people that are objecting. These are people who are objecting because they're saying, you're destroying the Buddha's teachings by doing this. You know, you're destroying all the possibility of attaining these results because if you refute inherent existence, everything's refuted, which is not true. Again, they've got the wrong meaning of emptiness. So let's go on to verse four, and then there will also be verse five in the same section. This is again the objection that the three jewels would not be tenable. We started with the four noble truths, then we went on to the four fruits and so on. Now the three jewels also are untenable. So let's read uh, verse four. If these eight kinds of person do not exist, the spiritual community would not exist. And since the noble truths do not exist, the sublime dharma would also not exist. So we've wiped out the sangha now because it, we don't have any of these eight results. So there, these are all aria results. Because again, stream enter is where you start with your initial direct realization of emptiness. And everything above that is a continuation of aria beings, you know, to, all, to the point of arhatship at the faux destroyer level. So you would get rid of what we technically call the sangha. The sangha are aria beings at the most technical level. We use the term Sangha in a very loose way to refer to our spiritual communities and so on. But when we talk about the Sangha jewel, we're talking about those beings who have attained direct realization of emptiness. So we're, we've already wiped out all of the people who are in that category, everyone who would fit into that category of being the Sangha jewel. And since the noble truths do not exist, which is the essence of the Dharma, the Buddha's very first discourse that gave us the teachings in terms of its scriptural content, but also the realizational content that is Im implied in there, then the, the sublime dharma would also not exist. So we wiped out another jewel. <laughs> We've gotten rid of the, the dharma and the sangha. So Tsongkhapa says to this, and it's very kind of repeating, but if the eight kinds of person, the four who enjoy the fruits and the four who have entered the path did not exist, the jewel of the sangha would not exist. If, since the four noble truths did not exist, the eight kinds of persons did not exist, then there would not be the exalted dharma, that is the dharma of the aryas. Cessation is the fruit and the path is that by means of which one approaches it. And it, it, it itself is the realized dharma. The teaching that elucidates these is the articulated dharma, again, what I called the realizational and the scriptural dharma. But essentially, both of these would you know, cease to be upheld within this view. Now let's go on to five, and I think that's all we're going to have time for tonight. Unfortunately, I can't quite finish all the arguments, but there's only one objection left uh, after this one. If Dharma and spiritual community do not exist, how can there be a Buddha? Therefore, if you speak of emptiness, this undermines the three jewels, which of course is really how we essentially define ourselves as Buddhists, is by having our refuge in the three jewels, right? That's what makes one a Buddhist. So essentially this is the objectors saying, you know, you've gotten rid of everything that is the foundation of what we believe in and what we are practicing. So I'll read this rather quickly. If there's no exalted Dharma, how could there be a Buddha? There could not be because a Buddha arises as a result of absorbing all of the Dharma. 
there, through great exertion in accordance with the exalted Dharma. If there were no Sangha, how could there be a Buddha? There could not be for four distinct reasons. And maybe I'll pass over these because I don't know if it's as important to get into the individual reasons. But essentially we can see that again, if there's no Sangha, it's through the force of the Sangha who uphold the teachings and who uh, have the realizations that people are, are able to enter into the path and come and practice and so on. So you end up with kind of, once you get rid of any of these components, Buddhas can't even be upheld. You can't even say that Buddha Shakyamuni could exist because he couldn't have existed through the force of, of not having the Dharma and not having the Sangha that he depended upon in his own spiritual development. So you end up with a lot of problems. It says at the very bottom of page 475, therefore, if the meaning of emptiness is expounded in this way, you will have undermined the essence of the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. They are called the jewels then because of the difficulty of finding them in their rare occurrence, because those with little merit will not meet with them and because they are very precious. So he took a chance you know, to insert a few little teachings on why we call them the three jewels as part of you know, talking about that. But essentially, you know, this is once more a faulty objection because it's not so. If we refute the inherent existence of uh, things, it doesn't cause the Four Noble Truths to fall by the wayside these four results to fall by the wayside, the Dharma to fall by the wayside, the Sangha, the Buddha, and so on. All of these can still be upheld within this view. So we have one more objection that we'll start with in the next class, the objection that such things as actions and their effects are not tenable, which is a 